Hello, it's David Greenspan, and this installment will be trying to explain orientation issues, orienting the pathologist and trainee to <coughs> chorioamnionitis, basically asking where the inflammation comes from, where the infection comes from, etc. So if this is a uterus drawn in brown, this is a myometrium or the uterine muscle. The purple is the decidua, which is really the endometrium or the lining of the uterus. And the fetus has implanted into the endometrium and then expanded. So he implanted and then expanded so that it takes with it a layer of the decidua. And that's why I've shown that the, the decidua then reflects back onto the uterine wall. But let's say the fetus implanted here, it's implanted into the wall, into the endometrium, and taken with it a layer of decidua. So this purple here, this will be the decidua that's following along the membranes, and that'll be the decidua capsularis. This is representing the placenta, this red structure, and underneath that is the decidua just where the implantation occurred, and that'll be the decidua basalis, or the basal decidua. And then the yellow line ref re represents the amniotic, my yellow circle here represents the amniotic membranes, or the fetal membranes. And this, of course, represents the fetus, and here's the umbilical cord. And here, this is the amniotic cavity. And it's important to emphasize, and the other thing just to point out is, this structure is the uterus, and this is the cervix, which is sort of the bottom of the uterus, and this is the vagina. This is the cervix, and this is the uterus. And it's important to point out that in, that in pregnancy especially, this portion of the uterus, the, the uterus itself, is sterile. And often there's a mucus plug here, and the vagina is colonized by organisms. And it's usually mixed organisms, and occasionally you have another organism called GBS, or group B strep. But that's not always present. Some women are colonized with GBS and some aren't. And I'm not really going to discuss preterm rupture of membranes or the complications of rupture of membranes, but sometimes membrane rupture occurs normally and physiologically, such as in labor. And, but it could happen that rupture of membranes precedes the onset of delivery and parturition by a sustained period of time. So let's say these membranes rupture and parturition and delivery has not occurred, and let's say labor has not occurred yet. So you have rupture of membranes, and often that'll go also with sort of removing or, or sort of destruction of the mucus plug. And then what will happen is, is if, if, if there's prolonged rupture of membranes and labor hasn't happened, that gives opportunity for bacteria to ascend and colonize the amniotic fluid and colonize the amniotic, the amniotic space, the amniotic fluid. And the bacteria grow quite well in here because it's a nutritive medium and they grow quite readily because there's not that much immunological defense within the amniotic fluid. And so this is these bacteria in the amniotic fluid, that's, a f that's because of the ascending infection or infection that it ascended from the lower, lower genital tract, and that causes the condition chorioamnionitis, which is infection and inflammation of the fetal membranes. So now, if we look at my model of, um, of the fetus and the membrane and the umbilical cord, so imagine now we've had a location where there's been rupture of the fetal membranes, and labor hasn't happened, so the baby is still in there. And now there's access for bacteria to enter and colonize the amniotic fluid. So then the next thing is an immunological response. These bacteria that are expanding and multiplying within the amniotic fluid will elicit an inflammatory response. And the first inflammatory response that they elicit is a maternal inflammatory response. And I'll show you from where. So here, 
you've got maternal spiral arteries, as we've discussed before, within the decidua capsularis. So the decidua capsularis has spiral arteries. And those spiral arteries, there's maternal blood in, in there. And they see the, or they sense the infection within the amniotic fluid. And then what gets elicited is, is a maternal inflammatory response. So coming all the way through from here, from here, from here, from here, all along the decidua, you get a maternal inflammatory response. So you get a maternal inflammatory response. And that really is the chorioamnionitis. I'll say equals chorioamnionitis. So that's the maternal inflammatory response to so all these maternal vessels here. There's blood in them, and they sense the bacteria, and it elicits a response. So let's look at a higher power view. So here's the amnion facing the fetus, facing fetus. Here's the chorion underneath. The bacteria are going to be sitting here, and the blood within the maternal space here, the maternal blood, sort of senses and sees the bacteria, the bacterial products here. And so then what you then get are is a, a certain class of maternal white blood cells, specifically neutrophils. First, th the first thing that they start to do, they're bilobate. So we'll draw them as sort of two little lobes. So each little two-lobed structure here is my representation of a neutrophil. First, they sort of inhabit the, the um, decidua as a, as a very preliminary step. And then they start to invade upwards. And it turns out that one place where they tend to really layer an aggregate is just between the decidua and the chorion. There's a little bit of fibrin in here. And you get neutrophilic infiltration into the subchorionic fibrin, and then into the chorion, hence chorionitis, and then they migrate upwards further, getting toward the bacteria, these maternal neutrophils, and now the maternal neutrophils are, are, are here, and now it's an amnionitis, because they're close to the amnion. And in fact, they get out, and they could actually get into the amniotic space, and the baby could actually swallow the maternal neutrophils, and we occasionally do see that as pathologists. So this is the ensuing inflammation that you get in a chorioamnionitis. So remember, the bacteria are ascending, and they come from the vaginal canal, and they enter the amniotic fluid. So the infection itself is an ascending infection, and you get at first a maternal inflammatory response. So maternal inflammatory response coming from the decidua. There's another place where you get a maternal inflammatory response. Remember, we spoke about the maternal blood coming in from the um, we, we spoke about the maternal blood coming in from the spiral arteries into decidua bacillus and circulating around here. So if you no look here, this is remember from the previous video. This is what we call the chorionic plate. The chorionic plate, and just at this location in the chorionic plate, there's a bit of stasis of maternal blood, and right here, the maternal blood sitting right here senses also through the chorionic plate senses the bacteria. And so what you get is you also get aggregation of neutrophils in the subchorionic space of the placental disc where the maternal blood is. It's a maternal blood space. So you get a maternal reaction here, as we've shown on higher power here. So you get the maternal reaction here, chorioamnionitis, and the maternal reaction here in the subchorionic space. And it's a joke at the University of Ottawa and at CHEO, the residents call this place, the, call this reaction, they say, to the neutrophilic response in the space of Davy, Davy named after me, because I find that this neutrophilic response in the subchorionic space is very, very helpful. So this will be the first installment, and the key point that I want you to take away with is the nature of the ascending infection so that the organisms come up from the lower genital tract, from the vagina, and the organisms expand or grow 
within the amniotic fluid, and that then elic elicits a maternal acute, because neutrophils are acute inflammatory cells, a maternal acute inflammatory response, both from the spiral arteries within the deciduous capsularis, as well as within the maternal blood space that's just underneath the chorion, the subchorionic blood space. In the next installment, I'll talk about what the fetus then may do.